أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذي خلقني فهو يهدين والذي هو يطعمني ويسقين وإذا مرضت فهو يشفين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد One of the aspects of life that Islam has addressed and has spoken about and emphasizes about is our health care and our health. Islam has paid close attention to this issue of having good health for one main purpose so that a person can live a healthy life in order to live a longer life in order to be able to serve Allah the longest this is the whole point Islam wants us to live as long as possible and with a long life you will be able to serve Allah and to serve his creation human beings the longest. However, a person with a bad health, someone who is not healthy, will not be able to perform his functions properly. Will not be able to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way Allah wants. And he won't be able to serve people the way Allah wants. Thus, Islam says, live a healthy life, Live a very healthy life so that you may live a long life so that you may be able to serve better and longer and more efficiently. That is why we see that in Islam, Islam encourages, encourages us to have a healthy life. Yesterday we were talking about the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and we said that the Masjid of Rasulullah had many functions and had it provided many services. Among the services at the Masjid of Rasulullah was that it had a corner for the homeless to sleep in, the, the sofa that we talked about yesterday. Another corner inside the Masjid of Rasulullah served as a hospital or as a miniature clinic. There was a clinic. There were doctors. These doctors would see people for free. They would offer their medical advice and medical services inside the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That means Rasulullah wanted people in his community, his followers, to be healthy. He didn't, anyone, he didn't want anyone or anyone from his followers to have medical complications. Most of the Imams would give medical advice, including Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah and some of the Imams, when they addressed many of life's complications and life's different aspects, among those aspects was a medical aspect. That is why we have a section from the ahadith of Rasulullah called At-Tibb nabawi Rasulullah would give medical advice. How to eat, how to exercise, what to do in order to live a healthier life. We have At-Tibb Al-Alawi, a compilation of ahadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam, how to live a healthy life. We have At-Tibb Al-Radawi, 
compilation of a hadith by Imam al Rida regarding medical advice, giving people advice on how to live a healthier life. We have a hadith that stress on being healthy. In one hadith, Inna Allah yuhibbu al mu'minu al qawi. Allah likes a believer to be strong. This can have several meanings. One meaning is to have a strong faith. Another meaning is to be strong physically. Physically be strong. Allah wants his believers to be physically strong. Inna Allah yuhibbu al mu'min al qawi. Not someone who at the smallest disease, with the slightest disease, will fall in bed for two weeks. No, Allah wants people that are strong so that they may work, so that they may produce, so that they may serve and protect. In another hadith, As-Sahha Afdalun Na'am. The best blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give anyone is a good health. A good health. Maybe some of us, because we're young, well, maybe you're young, I'm not young anymore. You're young, you might not know the gift of being healthy. Because when you're young, you're healthy, alhamdulillah. You don't need to worry about anything unless you break an arm or a leg. But you don't have, you don't, usually, you don't, usually you don't go through serious illnesses. This happens when you're older. Only when you're older and you're going to have to see a doctor once every month, maybe every two weeks, maybe once every week, then you realize that indeed the best gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give anyone is a healthy life. You know, sometimes when I'm standing in the haram of Imam Hussein, it's interesting because you hear thousands of people, they come and they ask for things that's in their heart. So sometimes I'm interested, I want to know what people are asking. And sometimes you'll hear the craziest things. Once I heard a mother-in-law cursing her daughter-in-law, asking Allah to kill her daughter-in-law. Anyway, one of the main du'as that I usually hear, Araqis usually say this, Al-Sitr wal afia Al-Sitr is protection. It's concealment that Allah conceals our weaknesses and our sins. And number two, al afia Being healthy. Being healthy is a, is a genuine gift. It's a genuine blessing from Allah. In another hadith, al naim fi dunya al-amn wa sahat al-jism. That the two best blessings that a person can have in this life is security, to feel secure, something that we in this country, alhamdulillah, we have. But go to Iraq and other Middle Eastern countries you don't have. In Iraq, you leave the house in the morning, you don't know if you're going to come back in the evening. This blessing is missing. And the other blessing, وَصَحَّةُ jis. Having a good health, being healthy. This is a bounty, this is a gift. In another hadith, أَفْضَلُ مَا سُؤِلَ اللَّهِ بِهِ أَنْ يُسْأَلْ عَنِ الْعَافِيَةِ One of the best things to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, this is Ramadan, the Al Qadr are coming up. I'm sure you all have a list of things that you want to ask Allah for. If you don't, you should have a list. Among the most important things that you want to ask Allah for is to be healthy. Is to grant you a good health. Because you don't know this gift unless it's taken away from you. This is, this is how things work. We take most of the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us, we take them for granted. Until Allah takes it away. Until Allah takes it away, then we realize what a gift that was. Our health is one of those gifts. It's a blessing from Allah. The day that Allah takes it, we'll realize what a gift it was. And we're taking it for granted and we didn't thank Allah for this gift. Now, Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 
Because Islam stresses on having good health and asking Allah to give you a good health, Islam has provided a, an intense program, a full program for health care, to have good health. Islam has done that for us. Number one, and I'll address only two points, and we'll leave it at that, and then I want my brothers and sisters to go and do their own research. Because the things that we say here on this platform, this is only just a few points. It's for the brothers and sisters that like to seek more knowledge to go and do their own research. One of the points that's very important is that our psychological state has an immense effect on our physical state. Let me explain. What you feel psychologically, whether it's intense fear, intense sadness, or intense happiness. These emotional states, these psychological states, can have a tremendous effect on your physical state. It's been proven scientifically. Scientifically, it's, pro it's been proven. Scientifically, it's been proven through statistics that those whom are always depressed, whom are emotionally down and upset, these people have a higher risk of becoming ill. Most likely they'll become ill. They'll either develop diabetes or high blood pressure or cholesterol or even cancer. Your psychological state has an immense effect on your physical state. And on the other hand, the most fit, the most healthy people are the ones that psycholog psychologically are okay. They're satisfied. They're happy. They don't go through depression. Nothing is bothering them emotionally. These people will be the healthiest. Your psychological state has an immense effect on your physical state. Sometimes you're perfectly healthy. All of a sudden you'll have a brain stroke because of what you felt emotionally. This could happen. I read a statistic that 47% of physical illnesses are caused by psychological issues. Depression, stress, mainly these two issues. Stress and depression. They are the main causes of many of the physical illnesses that we go through. Your psychological state has an effect on your physical state. I don't know if, I, if I've told you this story. Maybe I have a while ago, but I'll say it now. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It is said that a group of young boys in the city of Najaf had a dare. They dared one another. Now the city of Najaf is known for several things. It's known for the grave of Imam Ali alayhi salam. It's known for its Islamic seminary. And one of the things that it's known for is the huge cemetery, Wadi Salam, where millions of bodies have been buried. And these cemeteries are underground. They're in a basement. You have to go under a ladder, you got, you got to go on a ladder and go inside the basement where usually there's no electricity, there's no light bulb, obviously there's no AC, there's nothing. You go down there and you bury a body. Or if you'd like to visit the dead, if you have someone who's dead in that cemetery, you have to go down the ladder and see it. Now there was a group of boys that dared one another who dares to go down in one of these basements in the cemetery in the middle of the night? Now one of them said, I'll do it. He wanted to show off. He wanted to be all macho. He wanted to show his friends how tough he is. He said, I'll do it. 
They said, okay, you'll go. But how do we know that you'll reach the bottom? You have to prove to us that you've reached the bottom. He said, how? He said, you'll take in a nail and a hammer. You're going to take that nail and hammer it to the ground. The next day when we come, we're going to have to see that nail in the ground. If it's there, that means you reach the ground. If it's not there, that means you lied. He said, fine, I'll do it. He takes the nail, the hammer, and the idiot goes down. He goes, and of course, when you're going down the basement and a cemetery, what do you expect to see? What do you expect you're going to face? You expect there's all kinds of ghosts and gin and I don't know, all the nightmares that you usually see. You expect it down in that basement. He rushed down. He took the nail. He hammered it. He rushed up. He felt someone grabbing him. Someone was grabbing his clothes. He started pulling. No, nope, no good. The more he pulled, the stronger he felt that he was being pushed to the ground. Finally, his friends called him. No answer. They kept on calling him. There's no answer. Some of them wanted to go down. They said, that's crazy. He went down. He didn't come up. Why should we go down? So they left them. They left their friend. The next day, in the morning, they came back. They came down and they saw him dead. He was dead. Lying on the ground in the basement. Why was he dead? Later they discovered that he had a heart attack. Well, why did he have a heart attack? Because he thought a ghost had grabbed him. When they pulled him, they saw that the nail had gone through his, cloth through his clothing. He nailed his clothing to the ground. So he thought that what? A ghost is going to grab him. When he was pulled to the ground, he thought this must be a ghost. So he had a heart attack. There's tens of these stories. Tens of these stories that your psychological state can affect you physically. They can affect you physically. They say regarding, historians mention regarding Imam Ali alayhi salam, that Imam Ali, whenever he'd enter a battle, he would always win. Imam Ali never came out of a battle as a loser. He never lost any battle. They say regarding Imam Ali alayhi salam, that before entering the battle, he would throw a few words at his enemies. Right before the battle, he told him that, I'm going to kill you. You're going to die. So what happens is, he kills his enemy before he even dies. His enemy goes into the battlefield psychologically, has already lost the battle. Knowing that Imam Ali is already going to kill him. 50% of that person is already dead. Imam Ali has to come and finish off the other half, the other 50%. Your psychological state has a major effect on your physical state. Now, now what does this have to do with Islam? Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Islam tells us that we can feel better psychologically and emotionally. Islam has given us something that no one else can. And that is faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Compare a person who has faith in Allah and a person who doesn't have faith in Allah, are they the same? Absolutely not. A person who has faith and hope in Allah, this person's optimistic. This person will always be smiling. This person, nothing can put him or her down. None of life's complications, none of life's struggles can put, put this person down. Not the loss of a job, not the loss of a loved one, not a divorce, not even if that person had to file for bankruptcy. A person who has hope and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll be optimistic. Psychologically, he'll feel good because this person knows that this life is not the end. This life is only the beginning and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has another life for us and that this life is only meant to be a bridge for the other life. And it's what we plant in this life that we'll get 
in the next life. This is what this life is supposed to mean. A person who has faith in Allah and hope in Allah will understand this. That is why statistics show that religious people are more likely to overcome illnesses than non-religious people. Isn't that interesting? That the more religious you are, the more likely you can overcome a disease like cancer or an illness like cancer or any other illness. Because that faith, that hope that you have in your heart will bring life back in your body. It will tell your body to live and to remain here and to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That faith of yours gives you optimism. While a person who has absolutely no faith in Allah, at the slightest illness, at the slightest disease, he'll fall emotionally, psychologically, and he'll be more likely to die faster than a person who is religious. This is one way Islam contributes to our psychological state of being. Another way is through human interactions. Thank you, Hajj A person's environment, a person's surroundings, a person's society can have a tremendous effect on his psychological state. What we see during the day can affect us. Our friendships, our relationships, if you live in a sort of environment in which you're always arguing and fighting, or you're always disrespected and put down, you're not going to feel so well. You're not going to feel so appreciated. You're going to go through depression. While you, if you live in a society where you're given respect, where you're dignified, where people honor you and respect you, people don't put you down and bully you, you're going to feel better. Psychologically, this will affect you. Our surroundings, our environment, our community, our family and friends have a tremendous effect on us. A person, you see some people, they're always frowning. Other people are always smiling. One of the factors is their family and their relatives. That person's wife, that lady's husband, they have a tremendous effect on our emotional state. And our psychological state. Here, Islam says, be good to people. Be good, good to others. Be good to others. قُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ وَلْيَقُولُ لَهُمْ قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا وَقُولُ لَهُمْ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا The Quran emphasizes, be kind to people. Say good things to people. Don't be harsh, don't be mean. Be appreciative of people because this affects them. This, this doesn't just break their heart, hurts their emotions, it hurts them physically. It can make them ill. Simple words. Just the simple words, you can have an effect on people. Sometimes you will say a few negative words that, will, can, that can make a person sleep in his bed for a couple of days. Did you know that? If a person is affected so bad, so badly by certain words, it can have an effect on his health. And on the other hand, if a person is ill, but if he, hear, if he hears a couple of nice words, he'll stand up on his feet, he'll get, off, he'll get up from bed. He'll be willing to come back to work because psychologically he'll feel better. Rasulullah says, al kalimatu tayyibah Sadaqa. If you don't have money to give, if you don't have money to give to charity, say nice words. Say nice sentences. There's some people that are always positive. They're always positive. Whoever they meet, they touch people's hearts. They're always positive. They always have something positive to say. And you will see that such people are the most popular people in the community. While others... They have absolutely nothing positive to say. They're always putting people down. These are the worst kind of people. These are the worst kind of people. They think they're Muslim. They think they're believers. While they put people down, they break people's hearts. They hear people's emotions. Is this faith? Is this being pious and religious? 
Let's learn to be kind to people, my dear friends. It doesn't cost anything. Showing appreciation, being kind, saying kind words, saying thank you. It's not going to cost anything. If a husband decides to be kind to his wife, it's not going to cost him anything. He doesn't need to spend on her as long as he's kind to her. I mentioned in one of my lectures, not here, somewhere else, that a wife came to her husband and she said that I want you to make a list of 10 things that you don't like about me. She asked her husband to make a list of 10 things that he doesn't like about her. Now what a regular husband would do, he'll make a list, not of 10 things, of 100 things. But this man was a bit smart. The next day, he handed her a piece of paper. She opened it, and it was blank. There was nothing there. Nothing. In Iraq, I don't know how many of you are from Iraq. In Iraq, we call this guy, type of guy, Klauchi. <laughs> he gave her the... Well, a lot of you are from Iraq. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He gave her the piece of paper. It was empty. Klauchi, by the way, it means... Um, like a con artist, someone who's, who knows how to lie to get to, get to what he wants. She gave, he gave her the piece of paper, it was blank. He says that from that day, she became a totally different wife. She became the best wife ever. He didn't need to yell at her. He didn't need to scold her. He didn't need to beat her. He didn't need to threaten her with marrying another wife. None of this. All he had to do is show her appreciation. He showed her that there's nothing he dislikes about her. She became the best wife. How many of us could do this? Isn't this, won't this spread optimism, happiness, serenity in the community and in the family? And if a wife does the same thing for her husband, if parents do this for their children, children do this for their parents, for their neighbors, it will be a whole different society. So this is one, my dear friends. Islam gives us teachings to affect our psychological state that in return affects our physical state. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. Islam has also given us, and this is number two, Islam has given us teachings regarding prevention. Prevent yourself from getting an illness and a disease before you even catch it. Because, as the fam famous saying says, prevention is always better than the cure. Al waqaya khayrun min al ilaj. Prevention is always better than the cure. It's better to prevent yourself from getting a flu rather than get the flu, but now you have to come and take antibiotics. Avoid it from the beginning. Islam has set various laws and rules to help us in prevention so that we don't become. What are these laws? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad. Number one, avoid eating haram food. You see, many of our laws in Islam, there's a wisdom behind it. There's a, a reason behind it. Rarely do we have a law in Islam that doesn't have a reason or a wisdom. Most of our laws, there's a wisdom. That is why... Our scholars say that our laws they follow a law of advantage and disadvantage. Many of the dues in Islam, the wajibat in Islam, there are certain advantages behind them. And whenever Islam says don't do this, this is haram, usually there is a disadvantage behind it. Well, a lot of the haram food that is banned in Islam, it's because it has a disadvantage. It's because it's unhealthy. For example, pork. Eating pork has been proven. Even non-Muslims have declared and admitted that it's unhealthy. Pork is unhealthy. One of the main reasons is that pigs, they're scavengers. They eat anything. They're not herbivores like, um, like sheep. And cows, they don't just eat herbs. No, they're scavengers, they'll eat anything. And among the, among the things that they'll eat is feces. Pigs will eat feces. 
This is one of the reasons that Islam has banned eating pork because it's unhealthy. Animals that are not slaughtered on the Islamic way according to Sharia Allah, al-Zabih al islamiyah It's scientifically been proven that it's less healthy than the biha meat, Islamic meat. I'm sorry? More healthy. It's healthier. Or the biha meat, Islamic meat, is healthier than regular meat. Why? Just briefly, because when we slaughter, among the conditions, when we slaughter an animal, for example, a sheep, we slaughter from the veins, from the throat. And this allows what to come out? All the blood, or maybe 90% of the blood, to gush out of the body. But when you don't slaughter that way, what's going to remain in the body? The blood. You're going to be eating that meat with the blood. And that's scientifically been proven to be unhealthy. Scientifically, that's unhealthy. Many of the things that are prohibited in Islam, scientifically, it's been proven that they are unhealthy. Even crabs and lobster, according to most maraja, according to most maraja, that crabs and lobster is haram. I've heard that there are some other maraja that allow it. But the ones that I've said it's haram because it's unhealthy, there's something wrong with it. Fish without scale. Fish without scale is proven to be unhealthy. I mentioned this once. But I didn't know the scientific reason. I was talking about certain Islamic laws that according to most maraja, fish without scales are haram. After my lecture, one of the sisters sent me an email. She said, Sayyid, I came across this research paper. I read it and it shows how fish without scale can be poisonous for women that are pregnant. Well, this is one thing that some scientists and researchers have come up with. Maybe there are other disadvantages to fish without scale that maybe researchers and scientists in the future will discover. Thus, when Islam says, eat this, don't eat that, drink this, don't drink alcohol, everyone knows the harm of alcohol. There's a reason. There's a reason behind it. Furthermore, Islam has given us so many Diet advice, advice regarding how to eat, regarding our diet. For example, everyone knows that in Islam it is recommended to begin your meal with what? With salt and end with salt. That has been proven to be scientifically healthy. It is recommended that after you have lunch to lie down and put your right foot over your left foot. And so I don't know the exact scientific explanation for this, but I heard that this is also something happy. That's something healthy, I'm sorry. Well, it might be something happy to lie down. Among the Islamic teachings is to avoid eating meat. Try to avoid eating meat. You don't have to eat meat every day or every week. In a hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salam, لا تجعلوا بطونكم مقبرة للبهائم Don't turn your stomachs into a graveyard for animals. Some of us, our stomach isn't just a graveyard, it's a mass graveyard for all kinds of animals. This is unhealthy. What do you think high cholesterol levels come from? High blood pressure, all these diseases and every day there's a new kind of disease. Every day there's a new kind of cancer. Of course, if you don't take it easy. And one hadith, Rubba akalatin mana'at akalat. Perhaps one meal will prevent you from eating tens of other meals. Because you weren't moderate. Because you ate all kinds of things. You weren't moderate. This one meal will prevent you from eating tens of other meals. Islam says, eat moderately. Take it easy. Avoid unhealthy food. Avoid food that is very oily. Avoid food that will cause diabetes and cholesterol. There's a hadith that I've seen 
that says, once you're full, don't eat anymore. That might seem very simplistic, but you know, most of us don't, don't practice this. Once we're full, our stomach says stop, but we say no, let's eat some more. We'll keep on eating. This happens a lot. And of course, you know, our culture doesn't really help. They pour, no, no, please have some more, have some more. You eat more, no, 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 please have some more. Baba, I'm gonna die. No, it's okay, die, just have some more. I mean, what are you, murder murderers? Our culture doesn't help, unfortunately. The hadith says, once you're full, khalas, stop. Stop eating. Drop the spoon. Because as that food that you're going to be taking in after you're full, that's disastrous. That's the food that's going to kill you. Maybe not that same day, but in the long run, that food will harm you. I've mentioned before that obesity is one of the main problems here in America. I've read a report that 50% of Americans are obese. Obese means very overweight. Now, this causes all kinds of diseases. One of the, I mean, the most simple problems is, is that you can't even walk anymore. You don't fit anywhere. You don't even fit in your car anymore. Islam says take it easy. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Another point that Islam always emphasizes on, cleanliness, be clean. Before you eat, wash your hands. Islam emphasizes on cleanliness. min al iman. A lot of times people become unhealthy because of lack of cleanliness. Look at the countries with the highest rates of epidemics and diseases. They're the countries that have the least rates of cleanliness. Their streets, their restaurants, their homes, their restrooms, they're not clean. And the countries where people are the most, the healthiest, are the countries that are the clean, the cleanest. Islam stresses on cleanliness. Among the things that Islam stresses on is something that we're all practicing, inshallah, during this month, fasting. And when hadith, sumu, tasahu, Fast and you shall be healthier. This is one of the philosophies of fasting. That when you fast, you'll become healthier. Your body takes a break. Your digestive system takes a break. Your stomach takes a break. You'll be able to relax for a couple of hours. And you might, go, you might lose some weight. There's no problem in losing weight. Losing weight is always something good. Of course, sometimes some people, they gain weight during Ramadan. You know, they, they can't eat for seven, 17 hours, but during that six hours, they'll make sure that they'll, they'll make up for everything that they missed out on during the 17 hours. By the way, this has nothing to do with my speech. The worst mistake, and you probably all have discovered this, the worst mistake to do is go shopping while you're fasting. That's the worst mistake, because you'll come out and your cart is full, just full of things that you'll think you're gonna be eating once you break your fast, you'll fill it with ice cream, candy. I mean, you'll probably empty the candy area of the, in the store. And you're thinking, I'm going to eat all of this. Once you have your aflat, you come back and you realize you can't have any of it. You can't have any of it. You thought you were going to eat it, but you can't. One of the philosophies of fasting is to become healthier. It's to become healthier. And I told you about the scholar who had fasted for five days without any food. Only water. And he was saying, I feel very healthy. He was telling us that you should try it as well. I feel very healthy. Among the things that Islam also concentrates on is exercise. Exercise. What a beautiful word that doesn't exist in many people's dictionary. Exercise? What's exercise? Especially in the Middle East. You tell me, do you exercise? What's exercise? Never heard of that. Unfortunately, in this community, in this culture, exercise is part of everyone's daily activity. Most people, you ask them, what do you do every day? There should be at least 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour at the gym. 
For God's sake, have you ever seen a gym in Iraq? Or in other parts of the Middle East? Have you ever seen anyone jog in the Middle East? Unless they hear a car bomb and they're running. <laughs> There's no concept of exercise. While Islam tells us to pray 51 units every day. Praying 51 raka'ah every day, this is something nice, it's beautiful, it'll get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, this is an exercise. At the same time, praying 51 units, 17 of them are wajib and the rest or mustahab. This is exercise. This gets the body to work. This gets the blood flowing in the body. Among the most recommended acts in Islam is going to Hajj. Hajj is a workout. It's a major workout. Going to Mina, to Arafah, walking, Rami Jamarat, al Sa'i, Bain al Safa, Al Marwa. It's a major exercise. If you're not fit, Hajj is going to be very tough for you. It's recommended to go to Hajj every year. Among the du'as that we recite during the nights of Ramadan, وَرْزُقْنِي حَجَّ بَيْتِكَ الْحَرَامِ فِي عَامِنَا هَذَا وَفِي كُلِّ عَامِ Grant me Hajj this year and every year. In addition to the spiritual blessings of Hajj, forgiveness from Allah, getting closer to Him, the amount of knowledge that you will gain in Hajj, one of it is exercise. One of it is that your body begins to work. There are certain sports that are recommended to play or to learn in Islam. Swimming is recommended. Swimming is recommended in Islam. Horseback riding is recommended in Islam. Archery is recommended in Islam. There are several, there are several sports that are recommended in Islam. Islam says you don't need to be a couch potato, sit at home, just gain weight and do nothing. No, Islam says go out, go and exercise, be healthy, be athletic. Unfortunately, this doesn't exist in our culture, in our communities, it doesn't exist, especially back home. Maybe some of us who've come to this country, we've picked up these habits, but back home, these don't exist. Among the ways that Islam stresses on health care is that Islam has a law called la dharar, no harm. This law says that if any Islamic law is proven to be harmful for your health, you don't need to perform it. You don't need to perform it. For example, wudu. If wudu is proven to be harmful for your health, for example, you burnt your hand. You don't need to wash over it. You could do something else. You could do jabira. Or if you don't have warm water, if you don't have hot water, and it's, it's in the middle of winter, it's freezing cold, and if you were to perform wudu with cold water, you'll, for example, pick up pneumonia. Don't perform wudu. Do tayammum. I remember once I had to do this. I was in the UK during Muharram and the hot water wasn't working. I tried to do wudu. I really couldn't. I really couldn't. I did wudu. I did tayammu. Islam allows this. Islam says that if there's any Islamic law that's proven to be harmful for your health, don't do it. Go to another law. There's another law. Even fasting. Even fasting. The Quran says that if fasting is harmful for you, is harmful to you, or to your fetus, for example, if you're pregnant. You don't need to fast. You can fast later on after Ramadan. If you're pregnant and the doctor tells you that pregnancy, that fasting is harmful for your pregnancy, don't fast now, break it. You can fast later on. Woman kana minkum maridan aw ala safarin fa'addatum min ayyamin ukhar. Yuridu Allah bikum al yusra wa la yuridu bikum al usr. And if you are ill or you're traveling, you can fast some other days because Allah wants us, wants for us that which is easy, not that which is difficult. Thus Islam is very accommodating. Islam doesn't say you have to perform, for example, ghusl even if it means you have to freeze to death. No. 
Islam doesn't say you have to fast during Ramadan even if it means you're going to starve to death. No. Islam is accommodating. And finally, in Islam, there's an emphasis on caring for the ill and caring for the sick. Islam says that if you know someone who's unhealthy, someone who's ill or sick, pay attention to him or her. Go and visit him or her. It is recommended to visit the sick. Go and visit them because this helps them. This helps them psychologically and emotionally. Because when a person's ill, usually psychologically they're a bit down. Emotionally they're a bit down. Their, their morale is down. When you go and visit them, you tell them that, mashallah, you're looking better. You'll feel better, inshallah. You, you put hope in them. They'll feel better. It's recommended to do this. In one hadith, مَنْ مَشَى إِلَىٰ عِيَادَةِ مَرِيضٍ شَيَّعُهُ سَبْعُونَ أَلْفْ مَلَكٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لَهُ He who goes and visits someone who's ill, whether at home or in a hospital, 70,000 angels will walk with him. Doing what? They serve as bodyguards? Seeking forgiveness for him. While he's visiting the sick, they'll be seeking forgiveness for him because he visited someone who is ill and sick. Thus, this is our religion, my dear friends. And this is Islam's program for health care. Islam wants us to live a healthy life, a long life, for the purpose of serving him and serving his creation. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in doing so. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.